Hi, uh, good morning. So uh, let's jump right in. So <coughs> we are considering a lattice gas in one dimension where each side can have at most one particle. And uh, so here you see a, a certain configuration with zeros denoting empty sites and ones denoting sites with a particle on them. Now, the properties of this lattice gas are such that isolated particles uh, are called inactive and particles which have an occupied neighbor are called active. So these two particles are active here, all the others are inactive. And what happens to the active particles is that uh, the active particles can jump in, so they only have one free direction. This particle can jump here or this particle can jump here. Let's say at rate one, right? So one of the moves from starting from this one would be this particle jumps here. And now these two particles are active. So maybe this guy jumps back, right? And now this guy jumps here. And now you see the, uh, all the particles are isolated. So they're all inactive and the there's no more dynamics in this system now. So this configuration is called an absorbing configuration because once the system reaches an, a configuration like that with just isolated particles, uh, no more dynamics can happen, right? So when you start with uh, n particles on L sides and your density is greater than half, then you will always have some activity because there'll always be some particle which is next to another particle, right? But if you have uh, density less than half or equal to half, then you will eventually reach an absorbing state. So you'll eventually reach a state where all particles, uh, there's no nearest neighbor pair of particles, right? So that's called an absorbing state. So as you change your, the density of your system from below half to above half, you will see what is called an active, uh, so active absorbing phase transition. So basically you go from an absorbing state to an active state, right? So you go from a state where the dynamics uh, ceases to where the dynamics keeps on going on forever. And rho equal to half is the transition point. Uh, and at rho equal to half, there's only one absorbing state, which is this. So the system will eventually reach this state, which is 101010 going on forever. So now let's, how do the dynamics look like, right? So let's consider, uh, so these two ones are active and there is a cluster of zeros of length four here. Now this jump happens, so it becomes 0101 zero, one, zero, one, like this. Now this cluster of length four cannot be recreated by the dynamics, right? Because this particle can never jump back to, to uh, make from a cluster of size three, a cluster of size four. By cluster, I mean uh, con continuous zeros of length, you know, of continuous segment of uh, section of zeros. So this reaction is not reversible and uh, average length of zero clusters decreases monotonically, right? Because all these uh, clusters of zeros, they keep on decreasing in length. So the average length decreases monotonically. So you can define something called a transient ladder. So all these configurations with uh, zero clusters of length greater than one, so uh, with non-isolated zeros are all transient in the sense that the system will get out of them and then they will, it will never come back. So one can define a transient ladder based on the number of such, number of zeros in such configurations and that keeps on decreasing so the system keeps, the dynamics of the system keeps on going down the transient ladder. Now, if your density is greater than half, then you, once you go down the transient ladder, you'll eventually reach a state where all zeros are isolated, and then your system can keep on, uh, you know, uh, keep on doing the dynamics forever. And if your density is less than half, then you'll never reach such a state, and you'll eventually reach an absorbing state. So that's the transient ladder, which is very important to analyze the dynamics of these systems. So, now let's introduce a drive, an external drive. It is like this. So as I said, in the normal conserved lattice, so this model is called the conserved lattice gas. In a normal conserved lattice gas dynamics, this, uh, this reaction cannot happen. Now let's say we let it happen at a rate alpha, which is small. Okay, so an isolated one can jump to either of its neighbors at a, at a rate alpha, right? So what does this drive do? Firstly, it creates activity. So there's no activity here, but it creates activity, right? Similarly here. And uh, isolated ones can also just hop around until they find another one, and that will also create activity. And this takes the system back up the transient ladder with, at rate alpha. And the system is coming down the transient ladder at rate one. 
So the partition function can be determined just by counting arguments because every step of the transient ladder, if you can, if you know the num number of states at the transient at that step at that rung of the transient ladder, then all of them are equal equiprobable, and each rung comes with a with a weight alpha, right? So alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, so on. You can just count, and for any drive alpha, you can determine the partition function. This a of x is just some uh, depending on the boundary conditions and so on. And the leading part is this, okay? So this is, I should say, this is the leading part, there's another part. So uh, this is the partition function, which can be determined by counting arguments. And when you now take the limit alpha going to zero, you will reach what is called the quasi-static limit. So you're quasi-statically driving the system. So the system is usual, so if you're starting at, uh, in the active state and you take this limit, then you'll reach the normal active state. If you're in below rho c and you take this limit, then you'll get a measure on the absorbing states. So only the lowest rung of the transient ladder, which are all absorbing states, will uh, contribute to the partition function, and you'll get a certain measure on the absorbing states. What is this measure useful for? So recently there have been many studies looking at the active absorbing phase transitions on the absorbing state side. So they're looking at the properties of the absorbing states and what the average absorbing state looks like and so on. So one of the properties is that they measure and find is called hyper uniformity. So let's say, yeah, let's say the number, uh, let's say the number fluctuates, you, you look at the system in a volume B, a probe volume B, and look at the number fluctuations, uh, the number of particles in, the, in that volume, look at the fluctuations of that, right? Those scale as, so these are actually RMS fluctuations, sorry. Uh, those scale as v to the power alpha d. And for totally random system, so if you just put particles randomly on the lattice, you get alpha equal to half. If alpha is less than half, this is called hyper uniformity. So the system is more uniform on large scale than you would expect from just uh, randomly sprinkling particles. In, this is observed in jammed and glassy systems, and at the transition point, at rho c, between any, in any active absorbing transition, you see this hyper uniformity. So slightly below rho c, you do not see hyper uniformity, but as you approach rho c, the length at, uh, so small sections of your system will show hyper uniformity, but as you become bigger and bigger, as you probe at larger lengths, that hyper uniformity will disappear. So that crossover length diverges with an exponent uh, nu h. So from this counting itself and taking the limit alpha equal to zero, you can determine that for the CLG alpha is zero, because firstly, alpha is zero because the system at rho c is just periodic, right? So alpha, there's no fluctuations in the number of particles in the volume because it's completely periodic. And nu h equal to one, which you can get by looking at the partition function. So there's another thing called the configurational information density. This, is, this has become very important in jammed and glassy systems. So let's take a configuration, some, some given configuration of length L and use an efficient zipping algorithm to zip it. Okay, then you'll get a compressed file, which basically contains how much information is needed to recreate this configuration. Uh, if the size of zip file is S, S by L is called the configurational information density. And with the thermodynamic limit for certain systems, like for normal systems, you'd expect that the CID uh, approaches the entropy per unit length of the configuration, S of rho. And, uh, here, because I've said, you know, you look at the transient ladder and so on, and the measure that you get on the transient ladder, which is alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, and so on, and everything on, on one rung is equiprobable, this is an equilibrium measure. It's a, it's, it's a, it obeys detailed balance. So you can use normal tools from equilibrium statistical mechanics to calculate the entropy per unit length of the configuration. Right, and this is the weight of a configuration, so this is the ad energy. So this is like free energy minus a row into chemical potential minus, so, oh, have, have I defined x? x is like the weight of a particle, fugacity. So, this is from uh, Martignani, Chakin, and Levin, 2019. So this is, they do for the CLG model, which I've been talking about. This, so this is the configuration, computative, sorry, this is configuration information density, or uh, called computable information density. So, uh, they start with random initial condition, and then let the system evolve. And you see that this CID, which is like the entropy, 
Two more minutes. Yeah, thanks. So shows a cusp at the transition, right? So this is the time evolution. So cusp develops as time goes on. Right? So depending on which density you start with, you'll see that the entropy decreases a lot or it only decreases up to a certain point, right? So this, this black curve is what the final state of the system looks like. And since we have the measure here, right, we can do the same for different values of alpha, not time, but alpha. And this is what you see for the 1D CLG. So this is for different values of alpha. Alpha equal to one is all configurations are equal likely. All rungs on the ladder are equal likely. As you decrease alpha, you can see the cusp develop. And this cusp is not a non-equilibrium phenomenon. For any alpha, the uh, system is always detail balanced, the equilibrium measure. So this cusp develops, and as you take the limit alpha going to zero, you can see a sharp cusp here, right? So what is happening here is that the transient ladder is being squeezed. The right? number of states on the transient ladder is being squeezed, depending on what density you're at. And there's a rough correspondence between the time evolution, which is down the transient ladder, and alpha, which controls how far up the transient ladder you are. So that's why the two pictures look very similar. And you can also study this for uh, rela uh, related models with uh, extended range. So like the conserved lattice gas, you only have uh, activation when a particle is next to another particle. But you can have activation when a particle is within distance two of another particle. And then you will have uh, transition at uh, density one by three, and you will see a cusp develop there also. So, and you can do this for all n. So range four, range five, whatever, and you'll see a cusp develop. So conclusions, alpha equal to zero, uh, nu h equal to one for all n. Uh, on both sides of the transitions, for any, n is the range of the model. You have uh, entropy goes to zero as rho log rho. Uh, cusp develops through a squeezing of the transient states. And we also set the sandpile model under causostatic driving, uh, for which the transition happens at rho equal to one. And you get a nu h equal to two, which is non-trivial. Nu h equal to one is more or less expected usually. Uh, nu h equal to two, non-trivial. And uh, this is how the entropy goes to zero at rho equal to one. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.